Hi everybody, episode 18, the Roaring Twenties, uh, post-World War I. Also the Great Depression, which is gonna be after 1929, as most of you know. The Red Scare and renewed nativism, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant. You have to know that the 1920s is anti-immigrant, anti-Catholic, anti-Jew, anti-black, anti-socialism, anti-anarchism, anti everything that's not white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant. The Red Scare of the 1920s represented America's irrational fear of communism and this paranoia led to the denial of civil, civil liberties for America's sizable socialist, anarchist, and immigrant groups. That's the 14th Amendment, civil liberties for those that are born in the USA and people that are naturalized. America returned to isolationism. You have to know that after World War I, we stopped worrying about foreign affairs. We are diplomatically involved in foreign affairs, but we are not gonna go to war until December 7th, 1941, Pearl Harbor. Nativism, white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, and conservatism, think country, think William Jennings Bryan, think rural, um, everything that's the opposite of the flappers and the big cities and people that smoke cigarette and cigarettes and drink alcohol despite the fact that prohibition is happening. Uh, against un-American lifestyles, think immigrants. The World War has accentuated all of our differences. It has not created those differences, but has revealed and emphasized them. Okay, so you have to know that Soviet Union, the Soviet Union in 1917, because of the uh, treaty with Germany, I uh, can't, com can't come up with it right now, uh, Soviet Union is created with uh, Vladimir Lenin and then Joseph Stalin. Lenin st dies in like 25. Uh, the communism takeover, communist takeover of Russia in 1917 caused a red scare in the U.S. that communism might spread here. So we are very afraid of communism because now the Soviet Union has become communist. And these foreign radicals, these people from other places that are going to come here and do terrible things. In 1919, labor strikes and racial strife disrupted society. A red scare occurred leading to attacks on radicals and immigrants. Red scare is that scare of communism. We are afraid that just like Soviet Union, that if we have too many of these immigrants that bring these horrible ideas to the U.S., that we could have a communist nation. So everybody is anti-immigrant, anti-anything uh, that's not nativist. 1920s, nativism, nativism, nativism. Uh, foreigners have poured the poison of disloyalty into the very arteries of our national life. Such creature, creatures of passion, disloyalty, and anarchy must be crushed out. Woodrow Wilson. Woodrow Wilson, remember, he's a guy that wouldn't have any black people in his uh, presidential administration. He booted all the black people out of the White House. 1919-1920, Mitchell Palmer used raids to round up and arrest 6,000 suspected communists. A lot of them weren't even really communist aggressive communist people. They just happen to be from other countries. Pains were taken to give spectacular publicity to this raid and to make it appear there was great and imminent danger. The arrested aliens, in most instance, instances, perfectly quiet and harmless working people. Many of them long ago Russian peasants were handcuffed in pairs and for the purposes of transfer on trains and through the streets of Boston were chained together to try to make them seem like evil, terrible people, which most of them were not. So then this bombing that they bombed A. Mitchell Palmer's house, the um, anarchists bombed his house. This is what an anarchist is saying. War, class war, and you were the first to wage it under the cover of the powerful institutions you call order. They're talking about the American government. In the darkness of your laws, there will have to be bloodshed. We will not dodge. There will have to be murder. We will kill because it is necessary. There will have to be destruction. We will destroy to rid the world of your tyrannical institutions. That's an anarchist talking about the government of the United States. And then this is the opposite perspective. An advisor to President Wilson. What happened in Washington last night in the, in the attempt upon the Attorney General's life is but a symptom of the terrible unrest that is stalking about the country. As a Democrat, I would be disappointed to see the Republican Party regain power. That is not what depresses one so much as to see growing steadily from day to day under our very eyes. A moment that, if it is not checked, is bound to express, itse express itself in attack upon everything we hold dear. In this era of industrial and social unrest, 
Both parties are in disrepute with the average man. None of us are doing right by the average man. So we are deporting a lot of people, trying to make a point of shipping people out of here. There's no time to waste on hair splitting over infringement of liberties. In other words, too bad if we violate your rights. It's more blessed to give than to receive. This is called the Red Ark. In December 1919, 249 alleged alien radicals were deported on the Buford to, to back to the Soviet Union. Uh, Emma Goldman is one of the most famous and her former boyfriend, Alexander Berkman. Uh, is this us? Is this what we have? America under communism, this terrible, terrible thing. The Red Scare led to restrictions of free speech. The First Amendment. Some states banned the mere suggestion of a radical overthrow of government. In other words, if you even spoke about it, they might come arrest you, which is clearly a violation of our First Amendment. This famous, famous trial of the Sacco and Vanzetti uh, in 1921, a shoe factory worker and Bartolomeo Bartolome Vanzetti, a fish peddler, were convicted of murdering a Massachusetts paymaster and his guard. They became a very huge thing that lasted for years. The judge and jury were prejudiced because Sacco and Vanzetti were Italians, atheists, anarchists, and draft dodgers. That's what they basically convicted them of, not really murder. Liberals and radicals rallied in support of Sacco and Vanzetti, they were executed anyway. Everybody, everybody supported them because they knew they were being unjustly accused of this and they did not have any proof that these men committed this crime. I would not wish Vanzetti, I would not wish a dog or a snake to the most low and misfortunate creature of the earth what I have had to suffer for things that I am not guilty of. I am suffering because I am a radical and indeed I am a radical. I have suffered because I'm an Italian, and indeed I am an Italian. If you could ex execute me two times, and if I could be reborn two other times, I would live again to do what I've already done. Vanzetti. Okay, and then a resurgence in the KKK. It reached its highest ever membership in the 1920s, fueled by a revitalized nativism. I think we've talked about it before. This uh, KKK started in Pulaski, Tennessee, and that was anti-black, anti-freedman. But this KKK is Stone Mountain, Georgia, where it is revitalized and coming back. It is the strongest that it ever became, the KKK, in the 1920s. And that's based out of Stone Mountain, Georgia, and it's anti-Catholic, anti-Jew, anti-immigrant, anti-black, anti-everything that's not, you know, got it, white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant. The new KKK was against foreigners, Catholics, blacks, Jews, pacifists, communists, internationalists, revolutionists, bootleggers, gamblers, adulterers, and they were against the use of birth control. It's the Roaring Twenties. Some of those people are drinking, some of those flappers, some of those people are all uh, having sexual relations, and we have this new birth control that Margaret Sanger is going to promote that gives women freedom. Five million members, mostly in the South, of KKK continue to terrorize blacks as well. Uh, Ida B. Wells, you have to know Ida B. Wells, not Ida Tarbell of Standard Oil, uh, that wrote a, a muckraking novel about Standard Oil. Ida B. Wells is the one that made an NAACP with W.E.B. Du Bois, and she is famous for the anti-lynching campaign. Thousands and thousands and thousands of black men were lynched over the past 30 years. Just awful. Look at people happy, happy, smiling, smiling, smiling after lynching human beings. It's disgusting. It's honestly disgusting. Little kids. They take pictures of it with little kids. Come on. It's like a freaking party. Lynchings were a national problem. In 1918, Woodrow Wilson noted that from 1889 to 1918, more than 3,000 people had been lynched. Uh, 2472 were black men, the rest were black women. And that's not even counting. That's not even, that's up to 1918. That's not even counting the 20s, where the KKK is thriving and huge. For the next 20 years, it's still going to be massive on numbers of people being lynched. Awful. Every once in a while, a Jewish person or a Catholic or somebody would be lynched, but it's almost entirely African Americans. Of course, you know about burning a cross in people's yards. The KKK were stopped, not because of the horrible intolerances that were exposed, but because of money fraud. Because of money. Congress passed in 1921 the Emergency Quota Act limiting immigration per year to 3% of the 
of the nationality for those people in 1910. In 1910, not 1921, 3% of whatever they were here in 1910. We limit immigration like crazy. Everything nativist, 1920s, everything Republican, everything pro-business. It's almost back to kind of a gilded age. Way, way, way limited immigration. Uh, the National Quota Act cut the quota of 2% in 1924, just three years later. They made it from 3% to 2% when few Southern Europeans were in the U.S. and they excluded the Japanese entirely. So they didn't even just 2% and it wasn't 1910. Now it was 2% of what it was in 1890. Way, 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 way restricted immigration. This tells the story of how little immigration there was. By 1931, for the first time, more people left the U.S. than actually came here. By 1931. People are leaving more. And then, prohibition. It's called the Noble Experiment. The temperance movement, born in the antebellum, which means before the, before the Civil War, finally achieved its goals in the 1920s with national prohibition, uh, 18th and 21st Amendments. But the enforcement costs outweigh the social and economic benefits of this experiment. Trying to enforce people not drinking, uh, originally only about 30% of the population when it first happened uh, were still drinking. Most people quit. Uh, way, lots and lots and lots of things uh, became less bad as a result of people not drinking. Absenteeism, people beating their wives, it became less bad, which is what the temperance movement wanted. That's what the Christian temperance movement wanted. But then by the, later, later in the decade, like 70% of people are drinking again. The temperance movement had gained momentum in the 19th century, concerned about the dangers of drinking and domestic violence. It is true. It is still true today. A lot of the people that get arrested for domestic violence, it is because they have been drinking. And that's what the women were saying. Uh, the Women's Christian Temperance Union, temperance, this is about alcohol, rallied against alcohol and wanted national prohibition. This is a saloon. Look at this place. Isn't that disgusting? In 1893, the Anti-Saloon League was created. You guys remember about Carrie Nation. She busted up bars uh, back in the early 1900s with her acts. The 18th Amendment and the Volstead Act, which was the enforcement of the 18th Amendment, prohibited the sale of alcohol, but it was not enforced effectively because too many people violated the law. Most thought prohibition was here to stay. It gained the most popularity in the Midwest and in the South. And you know they were called bootleggers. We've talked about it because they would put their, their flask in their boot, and you know it was called moonshine because they would make it in, in stills in the middle of the night, so it was called moonshine. People would go to speakeasies. People would go to speakeasies where they were allowed to drink. They'd have a secret knock, and then they would be let in. The noble experiment tried to reduce crime and corruption and to lessen domestic violence, but it was opposed by many. It did do it, though. It did. It did make uh, less domestic violence, but it did not reduce crime and corruption. We have big mobsters and gangsters uh, came out of this, which have never gone away. Bank savings increased and job absenteeism just decreased. It was true as a result of prohibition. Prohibition resulted in startling reductions in alcohol consumption, over 50%. Cirrhosis of the liver, 63% less. Admission to mental health clinics for alcohol psychosis, 60%. And arrest for drunk and disorderly conduct, 50%. It did help. Just like the women wanted, it did help. But then it created other problems, like gangs and mobs. It led to a rise in organized crime with rival gangs who fought over turf to distribute alcohol to the speakeasies. A lot of times the cops were in on it. The people that were supposedly busting them were often in on it. Well, that, one of the most famous, Al Capone, Bonnie and Clyde. Some of you have heard of Bonnie and Clyde. Uh, he's known as Scarface. In the 1920s, gang wars in Chicago alone saw over 500 murders from these mobsters. Elliot Ness, we have the beginning of the FBI. Elliot Ness is the famous one that's hunting down all these mobsters during Prohibition. Arrest of gangsters was rare despite the creation of the FBI. Uh, convictions were even rarer. But he's famous. Elliot Ness is famous for trying to stop all of this mob violence and the gangsters and the selling of alcohol during Prohibition. This is Scarface, Al Capone. 
Al Capone, a.k.a. Scarface, was the most famous gangster. He was eventually arrested in prison for tax evasion. Not for many, many, many murders that happened as a result of, his, uh, of him telling people to get killed. To go kill people. Oh, Thomas Edison dies in his sleep at 84. Jury convicts Capone the same day. Um, Bonnie and Clyde. And they were shot, shot, shot up, shot up, shot up, shot up, shot up. Bonnie and Clyde. They just opened fire on their car. Gangs controlled prostitution, gambling, and drugs with profits from 12 to $18 billion a year. Bonnie and Clyde were famous gangsters. And then religion in the 1920s and the Scopes Monkey Trial. Uh, this happens in Dayton, Tennessee. So absolutely they love to put it on the EOC because this is Dayton, Tennessee. Uh, religion in the 1920s, remember, during this time of nativism, that's white, Anglo-Saxon, Protestant. It's talking about, about a lot about the countryside and good old fashioned country religion. And so uh, we're gonna have William Jennings Bryan is gonna support the religious rural people and he's gonna prosecute the teacher who's trying to teach evolution in class. The conservative 1920s witnessed a resurgence in church attendance in America, but the fundamentalist views of religion found itself at odds with the scientifically inclined secular forces of the modern industrial world. Secular means non-religious. Country, country, country. 1920s were a religiously conservative decade. Think Shackle Island in the 1920s. Fundamentalist Christianity clashed with scientific modernism. Evolutionists continued clashing with creationists. Tennessee mandating, mandated teaching creation in science class, not evolution. A law was passed in Tennessee forbidding the teaching of any theory that denies the story of the divine creation of man as taught in the Bible, and to teach instead that man has descended from a lower order of animals. How dare you? John T. Scopes, a teacher in Dayton, Tennessee, was charged with teaching evolution in public school, 1925, the Scopes Monkey Trial. If you can prove that I've taught evolution and that I can qualify as a defendant, then I would be willing to stand trial. It became a circus. It was a complete circus atmosphere. William Jennings Bryan uh, defended creationists at the Scopes Monkey Trial, and he was the prosecution. He was part of the prosecution for the attorneys. Uh, against John T. Scopes, the defendant. Are you saying that humans evolved not even from American monkeys, but from old world monkeys? Famous quote. Clarence Darrow, this big city slicker attorney, uh, made Brian sound foolish in his defense of the Bible, and not even five days later, Brian died of a massive heart attack. Uh, he won the trial. And John T. Scopes was fined $100, which was like nothing in the grand scheme of things. And it made him look foolish because uh, Clarence Darrow puts him on the stand to defend the Bible. And then he made him look foolish. Scopes was ultimately found guilty. And I think that uh, William Jennings Bryan even offered to pay the fine. But the trial proved to be inconclusive regarding creation. Uh, this is John Scopes. Your Honor, I feel that I have been convicted of violating an unjust statute. I will continue in the future as I have in the past to oppose this law in any way I can. Any other action would be in violation of my ideal of academic freedom. That is, to teach the truth as guaranteed in our Constitution of personal and religious freedom. I think the fine is unjust. Uh, Clarence Darrow, this is Clarence Darrow who they are calling the Antichrist because he is uh, going against William Jennings Bryan and he's fighting for people to be able to teach evolution. So they refer to him as the Antichrist. Christians increasingly reconciled their faiths with findings of modern science. The teaching of evolution expanded after this. And then the mass consumption economy in the automobile. Ford, 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 mass, <coughs> mass assembly. Mass consumption, the whole 20s, everything's about mass consumption. Toasters, cars, radios, cars and radios, number one, cars and radios. Henry Ford made them only $295. He made it a necessity to have a car, not just a desire. Um, so cars and radios are most famous, but they had vacuum cleaners. They had refrigerators, uh, wa washers and dryers, and they're very antiquated old kinds of washers and dryers and vacuum cleaners and ovens. 
all of these new technologies in the 1920s. After World War I, they clicked over a lot of the stuff that they were using to make bombs and boots and tanks and everything else. And then they put that toward uh, the economy domestically and made all of these things instead, these, these brand new appliances and everything. The same exact thing is gonna happen after 1945, but then it's gonna be TVs and cars and uh, actually suburbs, houses that they mass produce. So mass consumption spearheaded by the development of the automobile industry defined the 1920s as conspicuous consumption and general affluence became the backbone of the Roaring Twenties. You have to know about the Roaring Twenties. Mass consumption, mass consumption, mass consumption, and it's always on credit or installment plans. So the people started having debt. Before that, they always used to pay as they went. Prosperity took off in the Roaring Twenties. Most Americans had disposable income and materialistic consumption increased dramatically. Everybody's buying everything. Materialism, this big materialism happens in the 1920s. Advertising exploded using persuasion, ploy, seduction, and sex appeal to sell merchandise. Panama hats. Remington rifles. Oil lamps. Camel, huh? Lucky strike. We used to have just lucky strikes, now they had camel. Camel cigarettes. Wrigley's, famous. Sell them their dreams. People don't buy, buy things to have things. They buy hope. Hope of what your merchandise will do for them. New technologies contribute, contributed to improve standards of living, greater personal mobility, and better communication systems. Telephones, a lot of people have telephones. We have electricity now. Most places have electricity. I think they said by 1930, 50% of people had cars, and like 70 or 80% of the country had electricity. Uh, here in Tennessee, the Tennessee Valley Authority is gonna provide a lot of electricity to the rural south um, through hydroelectric dams. Cars, cars, cars. Cars are the ultimate luxury item, but they quickly became a necessity for most Americans. You could buy them as low as $200, $295. The US adapted rather than invented the gasoline engine, but Henry Ford perfected the assembly line. That's Henry Ford. Early cars were unreliable, but eventually cars like the Ford Model T were as cheap as $295 and easy to own. Uh, River Plant finished its car every 10 seconds. Ford created a $5 per day program, five bucks. The revolutionary program called for a raise in minimum daily pay from $2.34 to $5 for qualifying workers. It also set a new reduced work week with five eight hour days, giving us a 40 hour week. That set the standard. He set the standard for the 40 hour week and eight hour days. And he paid people $5 a day it even made it so those people could afford to buy that car. Here's, here's what else you should know. The wage was offered to employees who had worked at the company for six months or more, and importantly, conducted their lives in a manner of which Ford's social department approved. They frowned on heavy drinking, gambling, and what we, do, what we today would call deadbeat dads. The social department used 50 investigators, detectives, plus support staff to maintain employee standards. They went all over the city looking and watching you to make sure that you weren't getting trash, getting trash somewhere or meeting up with prostitutes or anything like that. Isn't that nuts? Wow. Any customer can have a car painted any color that he wants, as long as it's black. Whether you think you can or think you can't, you're right. I love that quote, it's on my email. It's true, if you think you can do it, you can do it. I shall do my best to put his theories into practice in Germany and modeling the Volkswagen, the people's car, on the Model T, Adolf Hitler. Volkswagen, Volkswagen, Volk means people, folk. Volkswagen is what they made in Germany and Henry Ford went and met Adolf Hitler to talk about his Model T with Hitler. I regard Henry Ford as my inspiration, Adolf Hitler. Uh, FYI, he hated Jewish people. Hated, hated, hated Jewish people. Cars provided freedom, more luxury, and more privacy, and they led to suburbanization. 
People could now not have to live right beside factories. They could live out in the country and drive into town or this new thing, the suburbs, which is really going to be a big thing in the 1940s. But you could live out of town now because you have a car. Accidents killed lots of people. By 1950, one million Americans had died by car, car accidents. My grandfather, my grandfather got in a very bad accident and his leg was straight for the rest of his life. When I met my grandfather, he only could like move his leg like out as he walked because it was always straight. Because he broke his knee in the way they set them then, it had like fused together. He couldn't ever not bend it again. He couldn't bend it anymore. In 1920, six million cars in the US, one per 4.9 persons. Automobiles created six million new jobs and took over. Rail Railroad is now in the 1920s no longer the number one form of transportation. It's now cars in the 1920s. People can go wherever they want. New roads were built. The gas industry boomed and the U.S. standard of living grows greatly. Cars equal the most important American industry of the 20th century. The most important, 20th century. Humans take flight. Next time. Have a good day.